Okay. So welcome to this fourth webinar in the series on inflammatory bowel disease produced between the Royal College of General Practitioners and Cranes and Colitis UK, where we'll be discussing fertility, contraception and pregnancy in inflammatory bowel disease. I'm Kerry Sapgulim, a GP with a specialist interest in gastroenterology and the regional IBD clinical champion for Wales. So to begin with, IBD is a chronic disease that affects a lot of young patients and often patients will get their diagnosis of IBD during their childbearing years. Women understandably have great concerns about the impact of, of their disease on fertility. Previously, rates of pregnancy were seen to be lower in women with inflammatory bowel disease and this was thought probably to be due to fertility problems. However, further studies have shown that actually fertility is not reduced in women with non-surgically treated inflammatory bowel disease. However, it is reported that women with inflammatory bowel disease may well have fewer children than those unaffected by the, by the disease. And this is an observation linked to a term called voluntary childlessness, a term that's perhaps a little misleading as it implies an informed decision made by patients, referring to women choosing not to parent rather than being affected by infertility. There are concerning observations, however, about the misconceptions around contraception, fertility and inflammatory bowel disease and a lack of discussion about these meaning that if we had a deeper understanding by both patients and healthcare professionals, we could impact on this decision making and patients would be better informed about the risks of fertility and the impact of inflammatory bowel disease. And I hope this webinar will hope to alleviate some of those misconceptions. Patients have expressed concerns regarding the risks of heritability, congenital abnormalities and teratogenicity related to the inflammatory bowel disease therapies that are that are used as well as concerns around the infertility. But there's no evidence that medical therapies used to treat inflammatory bowel disease negatively affect female fertility. And actually only medication thought to have any impact is sulfasalazine taken in men can affect spermatogenesis and consequently male fertility. And encouragingly, women with inflammatory bowel disease respond equally well to fertility treatment as those who don't suffer from the condition. Unfortunately, when it comes to the impact of surgery on fertility, there are more significant findings. So we know that women who've undergone surgery do experience significantly reduced fertility, in particular those that have under, undergone the gold standard um, surgery for pancolitis, which is a total proctocolectomy with ileo pouch, anal anastomosis, where we know that the relative risk of infertility is threefold greater after this operation. There is some evidence that suggests that laparoscopic procedures result in less, less pelvic scarring, which hopefully would mean that there's less impact on fertility, though the data is not really available to prove this. Even if patients undergo a total proctocolectomy with an end ileostomy, they continue to have the same kind of fertility issues. And this is thought that probably the deep dissection in the pelvis results from scarring and uh, in particular the fallopian tubes. An option possibly for women without proctitis could be a subtotal colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis, and this doesn't seem to have the same impact on fertility. However, this is only going to be an option for certain women and obviously carries the ongoing long term risk of uh, needing uh, rectal surveillance for rectal malignancy. So again, needs to be considered quite carefully. And because of the impact of pelvic surgery on fertility in women, I think, you know, very careful discussions need to be have with, had with women um, at the appropriate time so that these decisions can be made in a fully informed way. Moving on to active disease and fertility. So we've mentioned already that patients with inflammatory bowel disease don't have reduced fertility. However, wh whilst a patient has active disease, it can actually impact on fertility in a, in a few different ways. So the active inflammation can impact on adjacent organs such as fallopian tubes and ovaries, and this can impact fertility rates at the time of active disease. We also know that patients who are suffering with active disease may have decreased libido. They may well be suffering from dyspareunia from active perianal disease, and these can both impact on fertility. But in addition to this, depression, malnutrition and anemia are all associated with active disease, as well as impacting the ability to conceive. There's also um, evidence to suggest that not only does active disease reduce fertility, but it also carries higher risks if patients conceive at the time of active disease. And there's pre adverse pregnancy outcomes, which we'll talk about shortly. So let's move on to talk about contraception and inflammatory bowel disease. And we all know that there's a great variety of contraceptive methods available to patients these days. What there does seem to be is a lack of contraception planning and advice for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And again, I feel it's an area that's perhaps slightly neglected and not discussed in enough detail. Um, and hopefully, again, we can alleviate some of the concerns regarding this area. 
So the oral contraceptive pill has actually been implicated as one of the etiological factors in inflammatory bowel disease. And there's certainly evidence out there with a recent meta-analysis looking at 20 studies showing the increased risk of development of inflammatory bowel disease in patients who have taken the pill. But a more recent or two more recent systematic reviews have not shown this. So again, the evidence is a little conflicting. And again, when we talk about the association between the use of oral contraceptive pill and flares of the disease, the evidence is conflicting and the latest reviews have found no increased risk of, of uh, relapse of the disease with the oral contraceptive use, which I think is useful to be able to tell patients when we're talking about their options. However, women with inflammatory bowel disease do have an increased risk of venous thromboembolism. So it's an independent risk factor for um, venous thromboembolic events, increasing the risk about two to threefold. Um, and unfortunately, patients with inflammatory bowel disease who develop a venous, thrombo venous thromboembolic event have an increased mortality. So it's not insignificant. And obviously, we know that using the combined oral contraceptive pill also carries a venous thromboembolic risk. And I think we need to carefully consider the use of this, particularly in patients with active disease. At the moment, data on venous thromboembolic risk in patients with inflammatory bowel disease using hormonal contraception is lacking to show that there is a confounding effect. But common sense would probably tell us that the two go hand in hand. I think when we're having a contraceptive consultation with patients with inflammatory bowel disease, it's obviously important to remember all the other risk factors that we discuss in any other contraceptive um, consultation. So do still consider their smoking history, family history, age, BMI, medical history and so forth. But when a patient has inflammatory bowel disease, there are a few other factors that we also need to consider. So we need to consider have they been through surgery? Are they expecting to undergo surgery? You know, have they had significant resections, um, in particular small bowel resections and absorption for drugs and so forth? Have they got small bowel diseases? Are they likely to be malabsorbing? What are their levels of mobility? Are they very restricted by significant active disease? And what's their osteoporosis risk? You can see from the UK MEC summary table that none are absolutely contraindicated for use in inflammatory bowel disease, but it needs to be very much individualized. So moving on to sort of the key points really of inflammatory bowel disease and contraception, I think, you know, as I've said, we have to balance the risks of each contraceptive method against the risk of an unplanned pregnancy, potentially when a patient's IBD is active, because that in itself could be much more harmful. Um, the efficacy of oral contraceptives seems to be unaffected by large bowel disease. So for a lot of patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis, they can safely use oral methods of contraception. However, it can be reduced in patients with small bowel Crohn's disease, with malabsorption, with resection. So again, it needs to be considered as to which is the most appropriate method. Again, when we're prescribing contraceptive medication to women with inflammatory bowel disease, we need to consider the associations, as I've mentioned already, with venous thromboembolic events and osteoporosis in particular. So for the use of a long-acting reversible depot injection, I would say that we should avoid it in anyone that's at risk of um, increased bone loss. And we need to be re-evaluating that risk every couple of years. It's worth warning patients that rectal preparations may have an, uh, have an effect on the efficacy of barrier methods such as con condoms. And that's you know, just worth bringing to their attention because patients might be using barrier methods because of their concerns about the risks of using other contraceptive methods. Um, again, with elective surgery, it's important to stop combined oral contraceptives, so either oral or patches, um, four weeks prior to any elective um, surgery, but obviously providing an alternative contraceptive method. And there's also some evidence to suggest that the safety and success of laparoscopic sterilization may be affected uh, in women who've previously undergone pelvic or abdominal surgery. Moving on then to inflammatory bowel disease and pregnancy. And I think you know, in an absolutely ideal world, all patients with inflammatory bowel disease should undergo prenatal counseling. And ideally you want to plan to, the patient should be planning to conceive when their disease is controlled and the patient is well nourished. Unfortunately, we know that a huge amount of pregnancies occur as, as unplanned events. Um, and unfortunately, in the case of inflammatory bowel disease, if this is at a time of active disease, it does, you know, it does carry the risk of um, significant complications. So ideally, you know, patients should be referred um, for pre-pregnancy counselling. And in, most importantly, they need optimisation of their inflammatory bowel disease management. And this should be available for both men and women prior to conception. The, Optimal management of IBD needs to be not just during pregnancy, but also in the preconceptual period. 
um, because we know that active IBD at the time of conception is associated with higher risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, including miscarriage and preterm delivery. The overall message is that patients should be continuing with their maintenance medication, but I'll come on to that a little bit later, and they should be taking folic acid supplementation. And for the majority of patients, 400 micrograms daily, which is a standard dose, would be sufficient. But if a patient is known to malabsorb or have significant small bowel Crohn's disease, significant resections, or be taking sulfazalazine, then they need five milligrams daily. The other question that patients will often ask is, what impact is the pregnancy likely to have on my inflammatory bowel disease? And obviously, every patient is individual, and you know, you'll often have women telling you that pregnancies have, different pregnancies have affected their um, inflammatory bowel disease differently. But on the whole, women with mild or inactive disease at the time of conception will generally have no worsening of the disease during their pregnancy. However, if a woman does conceive at the time of active disease, um, which we know has carries more complications, she's also much more likely to go on to have active disease during pregnancy and during the postpartum period. The evidence regarding the long-term effect of pregnancy on inflammatory bowel disease is quite mixed. There is some data that suggests that IBD activity may be reduced following pregnancies, but I don't think that data is convincing enough to be able to tell patients that that's the likely outcome for them because other data sort of found no significant impact from pregnancy on long-term uh, inflammatory bowel disease outcome. So we've already mentioned really that you know, there's a higher risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes being reported in patients with both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And we know that those ag adverse outcomes are much more likely if their disease is active at the time of conception. The evidence for whether or not there's a risk of congenital anomalies is slightly more conflicting, but there are higher rates of miscarriage, prematurity, low birth weight, cesarean section delivery, and stillbirth. Um, what we'd be aiming for in an ideal world is that the patients would have a three month corticosteroid free remission prior to conception, um, which is why prenatal uh, counseling is absolutely essential to get the best outcome for both mum and baby. And I think overall the message is that, you know, a, a well mum is a well baby and a, and a healthy pregnancy. So that's what we'd be aiming for. This algorithm just talks really a little bit about preconceptual counselling for women with IBD and covers most of what I've talked about. And I think, you know, it talks about clinical assessment before patients go on to conceive. It also talks about sort of endoscopic assessment and preconceptual counselling, folic acid and so forth that we've already mentioned. One patient that patient, uh, one area, sorry, that patients obviously worry a lot about is drug treatment of inflammatory bowel disease in pregnancy. And I think that if there hasn't been appropriate counselling, it can be a bit of a knee jerk reaction by patients to stop their medication the moment they find out that they're pregnant. And this carries a high risk of them having a disease flare, which is probably much more likely to be significant to the pregnancy than any disease, uh, any medication that they're given. However, that doesn't apply to one medication, which is methotrexate, the one drug that we know is harmful in pregnancy. So we would advise that pregnancy should be avoided in anyone taking methotrexate, in any woman taking methotrexate, and ideally the drug should be stopped three months before conception. And at the moment, that would be the advice in the BNF for both male and female partners taking methotrexate. If a woman does become pregnant while she or her partner are taking methotrexate, they should be referred for obstetric counselling. Possibly a little less urgency for this if it's the male partner taking methotrexate, as the latest BSG guidelines seem to suggest that it, it's not so harmful if it's the male partner that's taking the methotrexate. But certainly if a woman becomes pregnant whilst taking methotrexate, she does need obstetric referral. Women on oral or rectal 5 ASAs should continue their maintenance therapy throughout pregnancy. We know that actually the risks of active disease are far outweigh the low risk of the adverse pregnancy outcomes associated with these medications. And the same applies to patients on thiopurine maintenance therapy. So azathioprine or mercaptopurine is safe and should be continued and carries less of a risk than having a disease flare or active disease. However, metabolism of these drugs can vary during pregnancy, so it might be worth the IB team considering monitoring metabolite levels. Again, we see a lot more patients these days on biological therapies, and um, overall the evidence is that they should continue this therapy throughout pregnancy. There isn't an increased risk of unfavourable outcomes, and there doesn't seem to be any increased risk of infections in the offspring. So the consensus is that women should be maintained on their anti-TNF therapy during the pregnancy. There will be patients who've got 
quiescent disease and they're at a low risk of relapse and they may well have a strong desire to stop the therapy patients will often express that they'd rather not be on medication um, and, it, and it can be difficult to manage that and I think for some of these patients it might be reasonable consider this, to consider discontinuation in the third trimester but obviously that would be left to the IBD and ob obstetric teams to decide. For those patients that have continued their biologic medications and therefore infants that have been exposed to the biologic agents in utero then they should avoid live vaccines for the first six months of, of age. What that means is that all non-live vaccines should be administered as per the usual vaccination schedule. So the only um, vaccines really that it affects is that rotavirus should not be given as it's a live vaccine and there isn't really any value giving it beyond six months of age. So this would be omitted from the vaccination schedule and the BCG should be deferred if it's indicated until six months of age. Moving on to flare management during pregnancy, then essentially we follow the same sort of flare management pathways that have been discussed earlier. Optimise the 5-ASA oral and rectal therapy wherever possible. Um, in those that are on optimal treatments or um, you know, aren't responding to treatment or can't tolerate it, or for those with Crohn's, then using systemic corticosteroids for a flare is totally reasonable and safe when it's indicated. Um, or it might be that they need to be considered for anti-TNF therapy and this should be individualized depending on the severity of their flare-up and the gestational age. Again, the indications for surgery, for urgent surgery, are the same as for non-pregnant women, and it shouldn't be delayed solely due to the pregnancy, but it's going to need this you know, careful discussion between the obstetric and surgical and IBD teams. For any pregnant woman hospitalized with an inflammatory bowel disease flare, thromboprophylaxis is essential. And this algorithm again just talks through the need for if there is a need for um, introducing sort of induction therapy for patients who are who are not on biologics or steroids and things and again you can see it depends on disease severity and the gestational age and those de those decisions need to be made in a sort of IBT team basis the bc the bsg consensus guidelines published in 2019 have a nice um, summary table really about the general guidance on pregnancy inflammatory bowel disease and a lot of the things that we've mentioned already about optimizing their IBD treatment, talking about other risk factors such as smoking cessation and nutrition and so forth, um, talking about the flares and trying to avoid um, diagnosis, sort of imaging throughout di uh, diagnostic testing throughout pregnancy unless it's essential and so forth. Again, the mode of delivery would generally be determined by obstetric considerations, but in the case of active perianal disease or previous surgery, then a cesarean section might be the preferred route of delivery. Um, in the postpartum period, all medicines safe to use in pregnancy are safe for breastfeeding and should continue. And again, breastfeeding should be encouraged and doesn't impact on the course of inflammatory bowel disease. So thanks for listening to this webinar on pregnancy, contraception and fertility. Um, hopefully it will give you a good sort of summary of the um, key areas, but any further information on inflammatory bowel disease is available on the RCGP website, that's rcgp.org.uk forward slash IPD, and there's some great resources there on flare management, medication, diagnosis, um, and all the webinars in the series.